Young Justice returned to the HBO Max app this week, just a few days short of Christmas for a brand new episode entitled Go Forth and Conquer. Now, I'm Cave Joel, and this is the video series where I give my thoughts and feelings on the episode that was, while also shouting out any comic book easter eggs or references I can find. So, with that out of the way, let's get to it, shall we? So, once more this week, we were treated to another episode-long series of flashbacks, helping to flesh out the greater Young Justice universe, only this time around, instead of Vandal Savage, we got to hear the story of Giovanni Zatara, his his friends call him John sometimes. We see that Zatara began his life as a workaday stage magician who enhanced his act using real magical powers, an act his daughter would one day very famously follow in. Though he didn't wear fishnets while doing it, granted no fishnets that we could see that is. In this episode too, we actually get to ever so briefly see Zatanna's mother, Cindella. She gets a major makeover from her comic counterpart, now basically just looking like an older Zatanna. This is interesting to me because in the comics who Cindella was and where she might be was a huge part of early Zatanna stories. Here though they don't really do a lot of that which is probably for the best as Cindella is also one of those characters who always seems to get crisis in and out of existence. Zatara we learned began on the path to superhero dumb when he first used his real magic powers to save a crowd from a fire. After that we see how his daughter reacts to the coming of Superman. Zatara felt he could be doing so much more with his life. And on a whole other level, Zatara responded to Superman as he too was an immigrant who felt that he could be using his amazing gifts to better his newfound home. Unlike Superman though, Zatara wouldn't have to do it on his own as it wasn't long after he was scouted by Kent Nelson, the JSA's resident magic man who became a mentor of sorts to him. In fact, it wasn't long before Kent was fully adopted by Zatara's wife and daughter as a member of the family, someone they could rely on while he was busy away either fighting crime or doing his magic act. It was Kent who had to break the news to his friend that his wife had gotten sick with cancer, and not long after, she would end up dying. How interesting is it that in a world filled with gods, aliens, robots, and magic, some things like cancer are still unfortunately inevitable. Sitar himself would become lost and rudderless for a bit, but would continue to soldier on, both as a father and a hero. In a nice little blink and you'll miss it moment, too, we see the first meeting between a young Zatanna and an even younger Halid who, in the last episode, referred to Enza as Aunt Enza, which I think now fully confirms that he is indeed Kent Nelson's nephew, much like in the comics. I like scenes like this a lot because they add a whole other layer of legacy, which is something that has always attracted me to DC Comics, but something that even they oftentimes forget or neglect entirely. Now back in the present, Child lays siege to the Tower of Fate, destroying it very easily. Not even Fate himself can seem to stand against the power of this particular Lord of chaos, and despite him turning a corner at the end of the last episode, Nabu continues to be a stubborn old magical coot, refusing much of the help from Zatanna and the Sentinels. To the point that, honestly, it starts to get a little annoying. Come on, Fate, you're getting knocked around. Your helmet has a big crack in it now. Please just take the help, would you? Mary also gets quite the moment during this battle. She has the chance to save Tracy and Khalid, but instead she chooses to drain their power so she can blast Shai. This plan fails horribly, and you begin to wonder why they let a person with magical addiction serve on a team where there's so much temptation everywhere. I mean, obviously the answer is so they can eventually overcome those issues, but it's made very clear here that Mary has a long way to go, and that that itch for power still very much lives in her. Also, now that they've set up the fact that she can drain magical powers, I bet that's gonna come back later. Now, there's actually two more minor subplots in this week's episode that deserve their own discussion. The first and involves Clary, and he may have lost his anchor and physical form at the end of the last episode thanks to Chow, but he's not given up just yet. In fact, Clarion says he's finally ready to ask the heroes for help, but because he's unmoored from time and space, he has a hard time making contact with any of them, so he plans to hijack a very familiar bus to get the heroes to pay attention to him. Yes, that's right, everyone. The bus that Superboy saved all the way back in Season 1 and the bus that keeps making reappearances all throughout Young Justice did so because of Clarion. He possessed it and turned it into a very magical school bus indeed. Ah oh man, so much for my theory about the Legion of Superheroes and time travel being involved in the bus subplot. Guess I was wrong. I also gotta sit here and wonder to myself if Wiseman and company always had this in mind for the bus and that this was part of some big long game, or if it was just recycled animation that they were able to go back and write a very clever reason for in the here and now. All I can say for sure 
sure, though, is, man, there were scenes that even I forgot involved the same bus. The other subplot this week once again focused on the downward spiral of Beast Boy. We've seen how his mounting depression has affected his personal life, his superhero life, but now we get to see how it's affecting his professional life. Honestly, I forgot on top of everything else he was a TV actor in a Star Trek-like show. The director is quickly losing faith in Gar, and in the end, they opt to write him off the show, maybe forever, seeing as Beast Boy wasn't the easiest star to manage even before Connor's death. I don't know why we have to keep seeing this every week. We know Beast Boy is doing bad. It's starting to feel masochistic. Back over with Zatanna and the others, we see Child's ultimate plan is to open up a series of chaos marks, basically giant volcanoes that will destroy the entire Earth. Things have gotten so dire, Phantom Stranger has recruited the rest of the superhero community and the likes of Vandal Savage and the like have begun to abandon Earth entirely for their own safety. This is quickly turning into a crisis level threat, but in a surprising twist, some of the villains, like the wizard, are actually staying and showing their better angels by helping protect the Earth. Perhaps this is some not-so-subtle foreshadowing for some things to come. Beyond that, the rest of the episode is sadly a bit on the repetitive side. Dr. Fate and the Magical Sentinels go to a big DC landmark, only to find out that Child is already gone. They do this like three times, by the way, and while it's certainly a spectacle to get to see this magical crisis needing multiple heroes to battle it all at once, it does start to feel like you've seen it once, you've seen it a million times. Eventually, the good guys do manage to corner Child and blast her with everything they've got, but once again, Flaw manages to tank the entirety of the hit, leaving Child unharmed. Did the heroes not realize that this has happened to them every time they've fought Child? How did they not think to come up with a new game plan? In the end, Child stands tall over the heroes once again, but perhaps help is on the way in the form of Clarion, who finally manages to track Zatanna and the others down. The final few moments in the episode have Naboo wondering to himself why he had to hear Zatara's whole life story. Which, I'm not gonna lie, probably a lot of viewers were asking the very same thing by the time this show was over. It would seem now more than ever the show is signposting that Zatara might not be long for this world, but before he goes, he wants his daughter to know the kind of man and kind of hero that he was. And so that was Go Forth and Conquer, and I'm sad to say that after the wonderfully character-focused episode that preceded it, this one once again felt very uneven and perhaps even scattershot at times. Don't get me wrong, I liked hearing Zatara's origin, especially as it ties into the bigger themes of magic and legacy and the history of Homo Magi on Earth. It just also felt a little at odds with the rest of the episode. Again, I understand what they're doing here. They want you to like Zatara and get inside his head before they eventually kill him, but, you know, it feels a bit unnecessary to me. I already liked Zatara, I already knew where he was coming from, and I would have felt bad regardless. Outside that, the episode was positively riddled with more pacing problems. The heroes chase Chow for pretty much the entirety of the episode, only to lose the same way they've been losing since this arc began. And hey, while we're on the subject of arcs, the last two were four episodes long, but this magic arc with one more episode episode left to go is going to be a whole five episodes. Which on paper might make sense because they're basically introducing a whole entire subgenre within the Young Justice universe. But think about it this way, if they removed all the little flashbacks and lore dumps from this arc, wouldn't the main story with Child still be really thin? My hope is that they can all end this in a satisfying manner before this storyline starts to get too long in the tooth, which I feel we're dangerously close to at the moment. Moment. And so then, that'll just about do it for me for another video, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, if you did, please consider liking and subscribing. It's been doing great things for my channel, and as we head into the new year, I could not be more thankful. So then, until we meet again, I have been Cape Joel, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.